Welcome to Marvel Zombies, right here at Comic Story, and where we take some of your favorite pop culture universes, be it a comic book, a video game, or a movie, and we break them down into digestible bites, giving them back to you as audio dramas. You see, as the years go on here at the Comic Story and channel, our videos get lost amongst our own videos as we've created over 2,000 of them. We put the best ones into playlists, but then even the playlists get lost. So every Monday, we bring you a full story series, bringing you our entire playlist into one long video. Video. And today, we're going to be giving you what we've done for Marvel Zombies. The Origins, Volume 1, 2, 3, 4, the spin-off with Deadpool and its conclusion, and then the return of the original Marvel Zombies. While the series does continue after our ending, it doesn't actually continue much of the original storyline and instead does spin-off stories in the zombie universe, and they honestly weren't that good. Either way, enjoy the Marvel Zombies full story right here at Comic Story. For this tale, we're going to need to travel to the Ultimate Universe and the Ultimate Fantastic Four. Poor Reed Richards is a young genius scientist who's being told he can't be a superhero. But with these powers, shouldn't he be? Well, recently he came in contact with another Reed, a Reed from another dimension. And this older Reed has told our young Reed, come to our universe and I can teach you how to be a hero. So our young Reed takes that offer and he creates a device to warp over to this other universe to learn how to become a true superhero. But this world, there's something wrong with this world. This is the world of Marvel Zombies. Young Reed panics right away as the zombie Fantastic Four tells him that he's been had. This was their plan. You see, the Marvel Zombie universe has run out of food, and it has some of the most intelligent zombies ever. So they tricked the young Reed to come here so that they can have some fresh meat. Young Reed quickly slips away and he jumps down into the sewer system to flee. But he won't get away that easily as the zombie human torch jumps in after him. With his heart racing, Reed runs through the sewer system screaming, Oh God, oh God, oh God, until he eventually, actually, loses the zombie human torch. He climbs back up to the surface and he looks around. How did this start? How did this world come to this? What has happened? Well, this infection it travels between dimensions, looking for the superheroes and the strongest individuals. It spreads like wildflowers and has taken over this entire world in as little as three days. Reed looks around the entire city and he can't believe the state that it's in now. But, you know, zombies can smell fresh flesh. And Reed is currently out in the open, where the rest of the starving Marvel zombies are roaming, and they can sure as hell smell him. But those other zombies don't matter, because the Hulk is hungry! And he announces that the stretchy boy belongs to the Hulk now, and he charges straight for Reed. Reed looks like he's doomed. He's just a young scientist. How could he possibly stop the Hulk, of all people? Luckily, he won't have to, as every car in the area begins to plummet at the streets below, crushing a good chunk of those Marvel zombies. Reed looks around in shock, and he realizes that there's only one man who could have done this. Magneto. And Magneto insists that Reed come with him if he wants to live. Magneto leads Reed to his hideout and explains that he is the last superpowered being alive in this world. And he's been rescuing the human survivors, but none of them have any power to stand up to the Marvel zombies. After some worried looks from the humans, Reed explains that he's from another dimension, and that's why he's here. He was tricked into coming to this world by the zombie Reed Richards. Magneto then looks panicked, and he looks at Reed and he says, You just opened a doorway back to your world. Your world is already doomed. Meanwhile, back at the Ultimate Fantastic Four universe, Sue, Johnny, and Ben are looking for where Reed went into his lab. When the zombie Fantastic Four comes through the portal, ready to feast on this new world. The Ultimate Fantastic Four quickly run out of the room, and they lock the zombie Fantastic Four behind five layers of airtight doors and gas the entire room, making them rather easy to handle. Maybe in their zombie state, they weren't as smart as they thought they were. Back in the zombie universe, Wolverine begins to smell the air. He can smell Magneto. Reed, and the other humans. So much fresh meat. The zombie superheroes begin to attack Magneto's secret hideout, and Magneto realizes one thing. If there's a portal open that's going to a safe world, that's where they can go. They can go hide out in that other world, and if they can get there before the Marvel zombies, that's their one hope for survival. They just need to get to the Baxter building and travel back to Reed's universe, all of them, and they can escape this together. They quickly run out the back door and they run back into the streets only to run into the rest of the Marvel zombie superheroes. Magneto looks at everyone and he says, This is gonna be difficult. And then all of the zombies turn blind. 
Looks like the rest of the Ultimate Fantastic Four has shown up, and Sue Richards made all of the zombies' optic nerves invisible. Now with his friends here, Reed works with them and they defeat all of the remaining zombies, and everyone flees to the Baxter building. Once they get to the dimensional portal though, and restore power and put up force fields, Magneto realizes that he needs to stay here. Somebody has to destroy this device from this side of the portal, or the rest of the zombie horde will just follow them through and destroy the new world. The Ultimate Fantastic Four also realize that this is the only way, and everyone waves goodbye to Magneto as they all warp back to the Ultimate Universe. Magneto makes peace with himself, and he destroys the entire Baxter building, leaving no way for the Marvel Zombies to follow through to the Ultimate Fantastic Four Universe. And so ends one of the most horrific nights that Ultimate Fantastic Four Reed has ever had, and it brings him closer to becoming a superhero, and it brings the Ultimate Fantastic Four closer together. They also have new captives in the Baxter building, because those four zombies that came through and got gassed, well, they're now just prisoners in the depths of the Baxter building. Meanwhile, back at the zombie universe, after the explosion went off and destroyed everything, the zombies survived, and so did Magneto. But what about Magneto? Did he die after this? Not quite. While he did destroy the Baxter building and the trans-dimensional device, he survived, and so did the zombies. And while he put up one heck of a fight, he couldn't take out everyone, and eventually, they ate him. Well, this is when we learn that when the zombies eat, they're no longer consumed by the urge to feast, and they actually get to look at their situation. They're still themselves, but they no longer heal, they no longer feel pain, and parts of them are decaying and falling off. But they will be like this for a little bit longer since they just feasted. And they realize that there's no longer any food on this planet. So what are a group of genius Marvel zombies supposed to do before they get hungry again? Well, they don't have to think about that for very long, because just then, the Silver Surfer comes down to say, hey! The zombies chase after him but they lose him rather quickly as he's kind of on a silver surfboard and moving very fast. While they're all standing around trying to figure out what they're going to do, Hank Pym decides to take his leave of the group to supposedly go find his wife, and he heads off, ensuring that he'll be back soon. But Hank doesn't appear to be looking for Janet. It's almost as if he's walking around trying to hide from everybody, like maybe he's trying to hide a completely uninfected T'Challa that he's been secretly eating from everybody. Well. Mr. Hank Pym is actually trying to solve this whole zombie problem, and he's using his secret stash of T'Challa Twinkies to keep his sanity. He's getting close to solving the zombie problem. Every time he eats T'Challa, he gets a little more sane and a little more capable of actually solving this problem. But there's an even larger problem. He wasn't as sneaky as he thought, because just then, Janet showed up as she followed him to his little secret hideaway and she demands that Hank share this meat with her. How could he be hiding these T'Challa Twinkies from her? But Hank simply says no, and he bites her head off. Well, I guess the Janet problem has been solved. Well, the rest of the zombies are all headed back to see Iron Man and all of the others, and while Iron Man wasn't too happy that he didn't get to have some of that Magneto meat, something else decided to just float next to them at this time. Silver Surfer has returned to let the zombies know that Galactus is on his way to their planet so he can consume it. But the zombies all just stare at him, and they decide that that looks like some really good silver meat. They all jump right away to attack him, and they learn that his cosmic powers can cut their zombie flesh like butter. First, Iron Man is cut in half, and then Wolverine's adamantium skeleton literally tears through his own arm, allowing his flesh to just dangle there. But eventually, even with his cosmic powers, the Silver Surfer couldn't stop the zombies from eating him, and they discover that once you peel back the candy silver wrapper of the Silver Surfer, there's some juicy cream filling on the inside. And what's interesting is that the zombies discover that if they eat this cosmic imbued cream filling, they're imbued with cosmic powers just like the Silver Surfer. Meanwhile, while Hank is off fighting for some of that juicy Silver Surfer cream filling, our T'Challa Twinkies wake up and he begins to walk off, and he decided to take the severed head of Janet with him. You see, since she's a zombie, her head still functions and she begins to torture T'Challa by asking him if she can just nibble a little of him. Just, just give her, give her a little. You know, she needs to solve this hunger problem. Maybe he can just give her like a, a pinky finger? Maybe she can just eat a pinky finger? But T'Challa begs her to stop. It's a little disconcerting to have a friend of his wanting to eat him, especially since she obviously has no stomach, and this is all a mental thing. It's not going to solve any of her problems. 
Back with the rest of the zombies, things get a little bit more bizarre as Galactus arrives demanding to know where his herald is. And Hank Pym replies, uh, we ate him, and we're still hungry. But being that this is Galactus, there isn't much they can do to fight him, and they run off planning to figure out a way that they can stop him later. So Hank leads them to his secret lab, where he discovers that T'Challa has escaped. So he better work quickly while he can think, as his hunger has been solved from Silver Surfer. Back with T'Challa, he finds himself confronted by Magneto's followers from Asteroid M. And at first, they think that he's a threat and they attack him. But T'Challa defeats the Asteroid M humans with only one arm and one leg. And once they all agree to stop fighting, T'Challa grabs Janet's head and he brings her along with them. So that the remaining humans, T'Challa and the head of Janet, can all head to Asteroid M and get away from the planet that's obviously about to be destroyed by Galactus. And once they get up there, they take the head of Janet so that they can find a cure, while T'Challa meets with the man in charge of the asteroid. His name is Forge. While back on Earth, the Marvel zombies seem to have figured out a weapon that can fight against Galactus. It combines all of their new cosmic powers into a single focused, cosmic-powered beam. And it works. It knocks down Galactus, and it's time for some giant purple meat. But as they knock him down, he lands in the middle of all the zombie supervillains. Well, this leads to the eventual. The super cosmic-powered heroes of the Marvel Universe versus the non-cosmic-powered villains. Uh, do I even need to tell you which side of this fight wins? Well, with the supervillains gone and Galactus on the ground, the Marvel zombies have one hell of a feast. Five years later, the human survivors of Asteroid M come down to the planet to see if they can help the Marvel zombies. They discover that if a zombie doesn't eat, eventually, it'll just stop having its hunger. And they took the head of Janet and put it into a robotic body. But they discovered that the zombies aren't here. And since the planet is still here and not destroyed by Galactus, where did the zombies go? Once they ate Galactus, they became Galactus. And now they go through space devouring any world that has an alien race that has a good juicy cream filling. It has now been decades since the Marvel Zombies left Earth on an intergalactic journey, and they stand at the edge of the galaxy with new friends. And every living thing in the universe has been eaten. Giant Man turns to his zombie brothers and he tells them, This is it. We ate everything. And Thanos tells everyone, This is Hulk's fault. He eats twice as much. So Hulk hits Thanos' zombie's head so hard that it explodes into pus and guts. Giant Man then turns to the other zombies. We ate everything in this universe, so it's time for us to explore the multiverse. And in order to do that, we'll need to go to Reed's teleporter back on Earth. It's time to go home. But back on Earth, there are survivors. We find this out as a young boy finds the head of Hawkeye, left there to rot for decades. He begs the young boy to save him, bring him elsewhere. He won't bite, he promises. You see, when the zombies were eating all of Earth, a few survivors were on Asteroid M, and once they deemed the Earth safe to live again, they went home. Being the only surviving leader, Black Panther was placed in charge of what would now become known as New Wakanda. He was also joined by Janet Van Dyne, a zombie that isn't hungry at all, because as Black Panther, Forge, and their scientist Reynolds have found, the zombies eventually just aren't hungry anymore, and they go back to being the way they were before they turned into a zombie. As proof, Janet brings the head of Hawkeye that Black Panther's son just found. They're interrupting a heavy debate as to what should be done about the children of the community, the Acolytes, because the children are starting a problem, and soon a Forge is worried that they'll overrun the community. But now the discovered head of Hawkeye is a bigger concern, and Forge brings it to Reynolds for experimentation. They discover that Hawkeye is in fact normalish again. Well, as normal as someone could be when they've been separated from their body for over 50 years and buried in rubble. With knowledge that it is now confirmed that the zombies can turn back to normal, Black Panther goes to bed for the evening, when suddenly an assassin breaks into his bedchambers and stabs him in the stomach while he tries to sleep. He kicks the assassin over, and Janet runs in to protect him seconds too late because he's already bleeding out on the floor. Realizing that there's no other options, she bites him, spreading the zombie disease. Then, with her hunger returning, she gets up and she tries to dive on Black Panther's wife. But he gets up and he grabs her. No, help me eat the assassin, Wasp. They munch on the assassin and then they regain their sanity, which happens right after they feast on somebody. 
Wasp and Black Panther lock themselves up until the pain of hunger can pass. All the while, the Marvel superhero zombies are growing closer. With the leader of New Wakanda locked up, the leader of the Acolytes, Cortez, takes this chance to convince everyone that they need to follow him now. He can help them repopulate a new Earth, and they can't be following a zombie. A monster should not be ruling them. He then starts to get people together to go kill their old zombie leader. So Forge, Reynolds, and Hawkeye all let them out, and they try to smuggle Black Panther and Janet out of New Wakanda. But as they make to the exit, they're confronted by Cortez. But this internal struggle is already at an end. Because the Marvel Zombies have returned! Hulk lands first and he grabs a human and begins munching. While Giant Man realizes these humans were left behind. And they can turn them into a breeding farm. He can repopulate the humans just so that they can eat them! He then grabs Hulk, holding him back, telling him to stop. If Hulk eats them all now, they won't be able to turn them into a breeding camp. He won't be able to breed humans for feasting. This is too much for Spider-Man, and he shoots a blast of power cosmic at Giant Man. They haven't eaten in so long that Spider-Man is starting to come to a census. And this isn't what they do. They were superheroes, and now Giant Man is coming up with ways to breed humans? Missing half his head and brain doesn't matter because Giant Man is a zombie and he orders the other zombies to kill this twit. Spider-Man must die. I'm tired of his jokes. But Spider-Man isn't alone as Luke Cage is coming to his senses as well and he joins up with Spider-Man. Zombies and humans begin to battle it out while Reynolds is looking for a plan and his answer is to turn on the force field, one that not even the zombies can get through. He turns it on cutting Luke Cage in half and taking off the leg of Giant Man. Seems like it was a good idea, except that they also trapped Gladiator inside of the force field. Spider-Man tries to talk Gladiator down, but you can't talk down a man that once commanded the Shi'ar. Gladiator punches his fist through Black Panther's chest, and then he tears Spider-Man in half. Wasp tried to tag him with her wasp stingers, but they just didn't do anything to him. Everything seemed doomed until someone stomped on Gladiator's head using some of Iron Man's old armor. Using it as a distraction, Spider-Man and Luke Cage both blasted Gladiator with the power cosmic killing him by destroying his head. The man in the Iron Man armor takes his helmet off and reveals to Iron Man that it was Forge. He raided Stark Industries and improved on all of the armor. Oh, and he made this force field. They won't be getting in here anytime soon. So Giant Man turns to his fellow zombies. Whatever, we didn't come here for this. Let's go for the reason we're here. They then leave the humans there and they take off for the Baxter building. Forge takes all of the zombies inside, where he staples Spider-Man's body back together, gives Luke Cage some new legs, reattaches Wasp's head, and they tie down Bruce Banner to keep him from changing back into the Hulk. Cortez then walks in, demanding Forge hand over all of the zombies so that he can kill them. Forge refuses. They just saved mankind, and they aren't trying to eat anyone right now, so why are you trying to mess with them? So Cortez begrudgingly leaves them, and Black Panther turns to Spider-Man. Why did they come back, Spider-Man? He explains that they came for food. It's what they're always looking for. But their plan was to go to the Baxter building and get the multidimensional teleporter. Forge just laughs at that, though, and tells everyone to follow him. They'll get a kick out of this. Apparently, he went to the Baxter building years ago and got the multidimensional teleporter. He just can't get it working. But here it is. And as he's explaining that, Giant Man figures it out for himself back at the Baxter building. And he tells his fellow zombies, it's time for them to go back to the last bastion of humanity. The zombies all return to the force field wall to find Black Panther and all of the other zombies inside waiting for them. What is this? Giant Man asks, and Black Panther tells him. We have a deal for you. We'll let you use the multidimensional teleporter if you promise not to harm anyone and just leave. Giant Man and Iron Man are in shock. Okay, deal. But as the force field lowers, they charge out ready to fight, and Reynolds turns on the force field, locking everyone outside of the area. This ends now, Black Panther shouts as they begin fighting it out. Iron Man did manage to get inside, though, and he goes right for the control room. But it's there that he finds quite a few people standing between him and the room. Everything seems to be going perfectly, except that they had Bruce Banner unconscious for the first attack, and he's now gotten himself free, and he's hungry. Meanwhile, back outside, Giant Man squashes Wasp between his hands, and Hawkeye opens fire on Giant Man, only to realize that that was pointless. He shoots arrows, and Giant Man is huge. Be my friend? He asks him. Back with Bruce and Reynolds, he tackles Reynolds, and he pushes him into the control panel, which lowers the force field. 
Seeing their chance, the Marvel zombies begin entering the last stronghold of the humans, and Giant Man reaches out grabbing Black Panther's wife. He raises her to his mouth and prepares to take her head off. When he stops, he turns to his zombie brothers and he tells them, the hunger's gone. One by one, the zombies all lose their hunger, and Giant Man turns to everyone. Truce? Oh, hell no, Cortez shouts. You killed everything in the entire universe. You must pay for your crimes. Giant Man tells him that the memory of their actions is punishment enough. Not for me it isn't. I'm gonna make you pay, Giant Man, Cortez shouts at him. But Forge stops him. You can't hurt them. They don't feel pain. Plus, do you think they'd let you execute them? Before they can do anything else, though, Hulk bursts through the wall, and he's hungry. Everyone jumps in trying to stop the Hulk, but he's the Hulk, and he will not be stopped until his hunger is satisfied. He destroys half the zombies while they try to convince him to stop, and all it comes down to is they need to stop Hulk's hunger. So Reynolds sacrifices himself. Without Wasp, he has no reason to live. Hulk eats him and reverts back to Bruce Banner, where all of the power cosmic zombies blast him in the head, killing him once and for all. And that's it. The zombies help the humans rebuild, and as they dig through the rubble, they find the head of Wasp. She survived. After three weeks have passed, Giant Man spent his time rebuilding the multidimensional teleporter. The goal was to give the humans a better world to live on, and once it's complete, he calls a meeting of all of the zombies. But that's when they find out the reason Forge couldn't repair the teleporter. Cortez didn't want him to. He likes this world, a small batch of humans that he can control. He's the one that arranged the assassin to kill Black Panther. He also killed Black Panther's son all of those years ago, and he's been trying to remove Black Panther's regime. And with that, he flips the switch, teleporting the zombies out of this world and into another. Forge runs in asking Cortez, what did he do? And Cortez knocks him out. They're gone for good. There's someone else's problem now. <laughs> Our story begins in the swamplands of Citrusville, Florida, with the state initiative team, the Command, investigating reports of multiple hostile targets, with one costume hostile among them. As the group reaches an airport rental shop, Siege scans the area and finds a woman among the scattered bodies. And as he goes to check on her, she turns, showing her teeth, and lunges, biting Siege in the side of the face. Jennifer Kale blasts the woman away while the Conquistador begins fighting off the zombies crawling out of the swamp. However, as more appear, they begin ripping him apart, and from the shadows, a figure shouts, This looks like a job for the merc with half a mouth! Zombie Pole leaps in, throwing knives, hitting Jennifer in the arm, and bites down on Wandar's shoulder. As Wandar struggles against Zombie Pool, Jennifer shouts for him to throw his body down towards her. She's got a plan. Wandar blasts Zombie Pool down, and as Jennifer turns a key, an airboat's blades begin to spin, and it sucks Zombie Pool inside of it, showering her with chunks of flesh and blood. Wandar floats down, stating, that he will be able to purge the impurity from his body, but he will need time to hibernate to cleanse. As Wandar begins to rest, an arm from the swap reaches out, grabbing Jennifer, and Siege says how he's so hungry. And as she crawls away, he chases after her. His cybernetics begin to call out that the biological unit is infected, terminating unit, and Siege shouts, No! I'm still hungry! But the cybernetic arm pulls out a gun and bang! Then Siege's headless torso falls before Jennifer's feet. Over at the headquarters of the Alternate Reality Monitoring and Operational Response Agency, also known as Armor, Director Charles Littlesky calls on the help of another hero to help them, Machine Man, or Aaron as he prefers. Charles says that he's been brought here to help them with a little problem involving perpendicular universes. Unlike parallel universes, these universes are crossing over into their universe, and the entry points appear to be growing in Citrusville, Florida. The one that crossed over is the Marvel Zombies universe. It's a universe overrun by a zombie plague. Charles then leads Aaron over to Michael Morbius' lab, where Michael explains that they need his help with creating a vaccine against the zombie plague, but they're going to need a blood sample from a human from the Marvel Zombies world. At first, Aaron tells him that that's nice and all, but he only came here because he was curious about armor and their work. And as he begins to leave, a voice calls out to him, stating, It needs a long time. Aaron turns back to see Joe Costa, and he tells her that they thought that they lost her when they fought against Ultron, and she tells Michael that it seems that the new medical attachments appear to be working fully operationally. Aaron then asks if they're sending Joe Costa alone, and Charles says that it's not their first choice, but they don't have any organic escorts to go with her. They don't have any agents who care about robot kind. So Aaron says fine, he will go, and while Charles begins to use his powers to open up the portal to another world, Michael returns to his room. He then rips the skin off of his lips, showing his zombie fangs, stating that Deadpool did his part. Now it's time for him to do his.
As Aaron and Jocasta step out of the portal, Charles tells them that this is Central Park and he will return in eight hours to pick them up and the sample. And if they're not here by then, he will assume that they were destroyed. Good luck! The two begin to head off towards the destroyed city, but above them, this world's flying heroes begin to swoop down asking, Where are they? Where are the people? As the two are carried into the sky, Aaron blows the head off of one as Zombie Falcon begins to rip off Jocasta's legs. Jocasta manages to shoot her eye beams, blowing him up and back with Aaron. He starts to fall out of the sky. Aaron extends one of his arms to catch himself, but with the other, he catches a saw blade and he extends it up into another flyer. Jocasta starts to lose her balance and she reaches into another flyer zombie to grab the intestines to help slow her fall. But as more intestines come out, it begins to rip. Before falling any further, Aaron extends his legs to catch Jocasta and she says that that one's getting away, but Aaron tells her, not really, and he fires a rocket causing the zombie flyer to explode out of the air. A little while later, Aaron helps put Jocasta's legs back and she tells him, okay, it's back on. And he tells her, he just likes the view here. Once Jocasta is back up and walking, the two begin to follow the scans of life across town until they finally find the only building in New York that apparently has power. Aaron begins to ask what's so important about this place, and while looking through the windows, Jocasta says all humans have been detected, and what they see is all of the superhero zombies eating everyone. Jocasta tries to scream, but Aaron covers her mouth, stating, it's clones. They're mass-producing clones just for, oh god, they need human blood, not clone blood. And then they hear a voice asking, Excuse me, but I'm pretty sure you aren't allowed here. Did my husband give you permission? Jocasta asks husband, and Aaron says no. They are, uh, travelers. And the woman then asks, like the man on the flying surfboard? About a year ago, a man appeared from the stars, and he was devoured. And those who devoured him gained his powers. Later, though, those who ate the man took off into the sky in search of new blood. And since then, her husband, Wilson, did what he does best, and he built an empire. Wilson has since protected her by controlling his hunger to eat her, and Jocasta says that she has a bit of an odd request then. May she have some of her blood. It's for a very important medical problem where they come from. The woman agrees and Aaron offers for her to come with them, but she tells them no. Wilson protects her here. She is what keeps him going. After getting their sample, Aaron and Jocasta leave, but after looking back at the bodies being eaten, Aaron begins to think back to how other robots were treated, and he won't let that stand. Aaron tells Jocasta to head to the portal. He's going to take care of a few things, and then he jumps through the window to the zombies, firing his rockets and guns. Aaron soon finds himself shooting and burning all of the heroes in this world while destroying their machines that they are using to clone humans. Once the last capsule is destroyed, a zombie bear appears behind Aaron and bites down on his head, and then spikes shoot out of the bear's head. The floor begins to cave in, and Aaron and the zombie bear begin to fall, and he rips it off, stating, God help me. I have no stomach, and I have to barf. As Aaron begins to pick himself back up, he sees a floating zombie Stephen Strange with a spell window. And as he looks at it, he sees armor. Kingpin, who is actually the man named Wilson, steps out stating, yes. After we had found Doctor Strange, he was only able to cast two spells. One was to make mana fall from the sky, and the other was to create interdimensional windows. And we have found your reality. All of your wonderful Avengers. The gospel loves to spread to superhumans. See, we only exist to spread the hunger gospel, which is why we sent one of our counterparts in to replace one of your armor people. So once you return with the sample, Michael will create a vaccine and spread the zombie plague and your world will fall. Aaron points his gun at Kingpin, stating that he loves it when a bad guy has long monologues. It gives him time to and then her hair reaches down the pit, grabbing him. Medusa screams for him to die, and then Aaron blows her head off, and Zombie Ghost Rider rides through shouting, HOW VENGEANCE HUNGERS! With his other arm, Aaron changes it into a sword, cutting Johnny's head off, and he looks back at the bike and he smiles. Seconds later, the building explodes as Aaron rides off on Johnny's bike, while Kingpin tells everyone to bring back whatever part of Aaron feels pain, so that he can stab it repeatedly! Aaron rides through the city, driving along the city buildings until some of the runner zombie heroes begin to catch up. One manages to jump into the way of the bike, causing Aaron to lose control and crash. But back at Armor Headquarters, a worker goes to check on Michael because he's late to a meeting. And as she enters, she sees Michael bleeding and he tells her, Behind you. But it's too late as zombie Michael bites down on her shoulder. She falls out of the room and another worker walks by asking if she's alright, and she jumps up biting him! Back at the extraction point, Charles steps out asking Jocasta, where's Aaron? And as the two of them look off into the city, they see a fire. And Charles says, I'm sorry. And Jocasta says goodbye. Slowly, Aaron begins to call out to Jocasta, but he's having a hard time as he's missing the lower part of his body along with an arm. Jocasta and Charles step through the portal, and as Charles tells Control they did it, Jocasta heads over to Michael's lab, where she sees him eating people, and he says that he knows what she's thinking. Operating without anesthesia, tsk, tsk. 
Jocasta radios back to Charles, stating, uh, we have a situation. And he tells her that he noticed. Just make sure that none of those zombies escape. After running towards the exit, Jocasta begins to weld the door shut. And then she hears people banging on the other side to let them out! The zombie wasp flies by telling her that she's just a dirty, stinking robot. She will never be human like her. Back down in the subway tunnel, the zombies begin to surround Aaron's broken body. But as one of them reaches out to grab his head, his hand passes through it, and from behind the pillar, Aaron steps out, stating that his hologram projector still works. He then begins torching all of the zombies and beating their heads around with other zombies' arms. As more of them start to run down, Aaron fires off his fingers into a wall, extending four razor-sharp wires, and the zombies run through, cutting themselves in half. Soon, a giant bear dog teleports in, and Aaron extends his arm, wrapping it around its neck, stating, You can teleport, huh? Well, that's good. Now fetch! Over on the current world, a zombie wasp continues taunting Jocasta, and then she slams her hand, smashing her, and rips the door back off, letting the people in. She begins to fight off the swarm of zombies, and then elsewhere in the facility, Aaron teleports in, riding the zombie bear dog, stating that he's been programmed to eviscerate their squishy organic bits and chew gum. And he hates gum! After shooting down the horde, Aaron pulls out a brain from one of the zombies, telling the dog to go fetch, except that it has a bomb attached to it, and as soon as the dog eats it, it explodes. From behind the shadows, zombie Michael kicks air at I've had enough! The hunger gospel will not be silenced by some damn automaton! I'm a vampire and a zombie! I'm a vampy and I can't be stopped! Suddenly, the real Michael appears, stabbing a tree branch through zombie Michael's heart, and then he begins to turn to ash. Aaron says, Dude, you just staked the zombie version of yourself. You're gonna need therapy for the rest of your life. Zombie Captain Mayan then appears through his shield shouting and symbols, and Aaron cuts through him stating, No, you know what? My name is Machine Man, and I just saved the flippin' world. Jocasta then runs out shouting, You're alive! And Aaron says, Of course, I'm too cute to die. Now give me some of that sweet, sweet robot love. After their blissful robot kiss, Charles tells him it's not over. Someone managed to use the teleporter to get out of the facility. And Michael says, if he may, he would like to assemble and lead the team to catch whoever that was. Because this has been a long time coming. And the Midnight Suns must return. The two zombies that escaped the armor facility were teleported to the middle of the ocean about a week ago, and since then have been biting a lot of the undersea dwellers, and they're now attacking a cruise ship. Not long after the reports that the cruise ship is under attack, Morbius and the Midnight Suns rush in to contain the zombies. The first of that group, Jack Russell, quickly jumps through the portal, transforming into his werewolf form, and he begins slashing and ripping apart the zombie sea creatures. Right behind him comes Jennifer Kale, the survivor from the first contact group that was sent to Florida, and next down is Damian Hellstrom, burning away anything that moves. Finally closing out the portal jumps Morbius himself, firing canisters filled with an oxidizing bacteria that when exposed to the zombie virus proved to be rather explosive. However, before being sent down, Morbius developed a vaccine to protect the team in case they get bitten. But unlike other vaccines, there's a slight chance they may develop a full-blown version of the disease themselves. Elsewhere, though, the two escapees, Simon Garth and the head of Zombie Pool, emerge onto the beaches of the island nation of Taino in the Caribbean Sea. Simon, holding the head of Zombie Pool, begins to walk up to the beach and into the forest, and as the two of them make their way through, Zombie Pool says that ever since he lost his body, he really doesn't feel the hunger anymore. Who knew losing 93% of your body would mass cure your zombiness? Now it's just time to settle down. But as Zombie Pool goes on talking, Simon doesn't say anything, and Zombie Pool tells him that's what he likes about him, just letting his actions speak for themselves. But where are we going, Simon? Zombie Pool looks around and he sees them walking through the camp and he notices the chemicals that they are using. They're making drugs, cocaine to be specific. Simon continues on until they walk into a cave and see a man sitting and the man tells Simon that he knows that he's a zombie. But what is that? Simon explains that the head is all that remains of the mercenary named Deadpool from a different dimension. And the man tells him that he is Black Talon. And Zombie Pool says, For a cool name like that, you totally ruined it by dressing like that. You really need to get your priorities in order. Talon then says that he holds the amulet of Dambala, the same as the one around Simon's neck, which is why he was drawn here. However, it doesn't control the other dead, regrettably, so they put them in the pen. Zombie Pool shouts out, Oh hell no! No one is caging this bird! This looks like a job for the merc with only a mouth! And he leaps in, biting one of Talon's guards. However, it is short-lived as another guard skewers Zombie Pool's head to a stick to stomp him. A short while later, Talon sits down, speaking on an intercom, stating how he may have to come across something of interest. Something that could destroy all of the heroes permanently. And on the other line, the hood sits, telling him to go on. He's listening. 
Back out at sea, the cruise ship, the Midnight Suns were on, begins to sail towards the beaches of the island. But as it gets closer, it explodes! And on the shore, Jennifer teleports Jack and Morbius down. And Morbius tells him, that was close. But where's Damien? Through the burning ship, Damien calls out that his concern is appreciated, but the fires of this earth do not burn him. So he figured that he would just ignite the engine before landfall. Over in Hell's Kitchen at Hood's hideout, some of his men questioned Talon's intentions for selling them an end-of-the-world weapon stating that the Armageddon might be bad for business. The voice of Dormammu says, Perhaps it might, but as long as you, Parker Robbins, wear the hood of Nishanti, you serve a higher calling. Since the spells of their world's Sorcerer Supreme prevented him from acting directly in this plane of existence, he must deploy thralls such as Parker Robbins. And he wants this virus. And since he wants it, so does Parker Robbins. Not long after that, Hood and the rest of his men appear before Talon. But as they do, Dormammu tells his human puppet to beware. Enemies are approaching them from the jungles. Out in the jungle, the Midnight Suns come across a grave, but Damon mentions that he feels like they're being watched by entities far beyond his comprehension. As they get closer, they begin to notice the graves here have been hollowed out, and with a quick swing, Morbius is cracked across the face with a shovel. Soon, members of the Night Shift all jump out, and they begin to attack each Midnight Sun. Needle leaps out, stabbing Damon with a needle, while Danson begins to stop Jennifer from using her powers. While stunned, Danson jumps in to kick Jennifer away, and Digger begins to bury Morbius. As the dirt is thrown on him, Morbius tells tells him that he spilled his blood. He really shouldn't have done that. Digger laughs at him asking why, and Morbius jumps out of the grave telling him, because now he wants more. Damon begins to burn away the needle that stabbed him, and then he turns his focus to Tatter and starts shooting fire. Everyone shifts who they're attacking to, and Hood says that they've disappointed him. They're just a bunch of wannabe heroes. And Morbius tells him, you're wrong. And then as he turns to look at him, Morbius' face begins to drip with blood from Dance and telling him, we're not heroes, we're monsters. Jennifer tells him that he needs to snap out of it. Zombies are starting to make their way towards them, and Morbius pulls out his gun and begins firing. Except this time, the zombies are not just exploding, they're releasing a gas. One one that is spreading the zombie virus. Hood begins to ask what the heck is going on, and Morbius says that his vaccine, the zombie virus has mutated in reaction to it and it's evolved. Jennifer begins to have flashbacks to when she fought zombie pool stating it's happening again, and then she hears a voice. Dormammu appears before her stating, no, I can grant your powers, all you need to do is take my hand. Dormammu goes on telling her that he knows that she studied under Dakma the Enchanter himself, but she merely lets him baptize her. She could effortlessly destroy any undead. Jennifer tells him that she doesn't want to save her skin from the brain munchers just to corrupt her soul, and that she breaks a vial. The liquid seeps into the ground and the roots begin to grow, and then before long, a swamp walker stands behind her. The Swamp Walker swings at Dormammu, but his arm just passes through and he says that he is just only a projection. Jennifer says that she can also dispel him from even doing that, so whatever he's selling, she ain't buying. But before fading away, he tells Jennifer, I will go, but if you desire my aid, just call my name. After escaping the zombie cloud, the sun begins to rise and the group sets up in an abandoned building. Jack mentions that the winds are changing towards the west, going towards the resorts and the innocent villages. And Morbius says, I know right, we just need more data. And Jack says, without their immunity to the undead virus, he doesn't know how they'll. But Jennifer stops him, stating, immunity? Well, she brought some mud from a swamp in Florida just in case they needed to summon an old friend. So everyone, meet Man-Thing. A little ways off in a small village, the townspeople begin running and screaming as Zombie Pole begins to shout, Don't be alarmed! We're not going to eat you! That's just an ugly stereotype! We're just life impaired and looking for a place to call our own! We will work! But before long, the zombie cloud begins to cover the town, and with it, the cloud begins to rain. However, the rain from it is a red rain, one that transforms people into the zombies. Back with the group, everyone heads over to Talon's plantation, and as the doors open, Talon tells Hood to hurry to him so he can call upon protection. However, Hood runs over, punching him, telling him to shut up, and Morbius asks, why side with them? The Hood then tells him that that guy is just a tool. The monster squid that is Man-Thing seems to actually know what they're doing, so yeah, unlikely team-up. Meanwhile, Man-Thing walks through the rain. Even though he isn't fully immune to the virus, he gains his powers from the Earth, and the Earth is replenishing him quicker than the rain can dissolve him. While Jennifer keeps her eyes open, Morbius then contacts Arbor to report their current status. Charles says that he can see that they have a problem. Their computers are showing that the cloud will spread within an hour to the coast, so unless they can stop it before then, they're going to have to issue an orbital nuclear strike on the entire island. Elsewhere, though, Simon and Zombiepool head to one of the resorts while Zombiepool shouts that they're being followed by some giant swamp thing. Help! 
But before Razorwire can say that he'll save them and stop the monster with extreme prejudice, the rain follows and begins to burn him, Ogre, and Lightning Fist. Man-Thing continues his pursuit of Simon, and the rain begins to remake the three heroes into one large undead creature. The creature blasts away Man-Thing's arm, and just as he goes to regrow it, it then splits him with a lamppost. Man-Thing breaks off the post and begins to fuse back together and then swings at the creature, but before it could attack, the creature grabs the post, holding Man-Thing off the ground. Man-Thing's body begins to dissolve and Jennifer calls out that they are too late. Man-Thing is dead. She then begins to cry at the loss of the Man-Thing, and then she hears Jack from behind her, telling her that the only thing that they should fear is fear itself, so let him show her. Let the hunger show her. Jennifer begins to panic, and throughout it, she calls out to him, Dormammu! Dormammu! Downstairs, Morbius begins to talk to Damon about their next move regarding the nuclear strike, and that's when he's zapped, and a voice says, she has a better idea. She'll seize control of the mist, so that her lord Dormammu can lay total domination to this world. Jennifer then begins to call upon the undead night shift to keep Morbius and the rest at bay while she projects herself up into the virus cloud. What she sees, though, is that the virus is now acting as a single collective mind. One that she can control. But there's a second mind here. What formidable genius could possess the willpower to evoke this swirling mass psyche? And then she hears scratching. Among the mist, she sees Zombie Pool, now with a body, stating that it's so great to actually scratch that phantom limb. Nice bikini, by the way. Jennifer says that it was him who hurt her before. He shall die, and she fires a blast, exploding Zombie Pool's newly formed body. A short while later, Simon picks up Zombie Pool's head and he says, For a moment, I was a part of something bigger than myself. Like I finally had a home. But even in there, they found me. But looking back at that swamp, watching him call a thing that's chasing us, I kind of envy him. From the remains of the man thing, though, a hand begins to form. Simon walks out to the pier, and Zombie Pool tells him, You know, we'll always be chased. I'm starting to think we should just let ourselves get caught. Just end it all now, Simon. Back in the plantation, Jennifer begins to attack Damon, and he tells her that she's not Jennifer, and a voice tells him, of course not. It's Patsy, your wife. Patsy leans in telling him, how about they just forget about this Dormammu nonsense? And he pushes her back and Jennifer begins laughing, calling him a weakling. Damon grabs a hold of Jennifer, telling her that she doesn't have to run. They are the Midnight Suns. They bring the light to darkness. Slowly, Damon's arm begins to burn, and then Dormammu begins to scream no as Jennifer begins to reject him from inside herself. While Morbius continues to struggle with Jack, he calls out to Jennifer, stating that he studied Jack before they left. His biochemistry changes under a full moon. Jack Russell might be infected. And as Morbius throws him away, Jennifer says, but not the werewolf! And she casts a spell shining moonlight, and Jack changes. Once Morbius helps Jennifer back up, she says that they need to transform the hive mind into something. And Morbius grabs Talon, telling him that they need his voodoo. Together, Jennifer and Talon begin to channel the hive mind. And Talon says, who are they going to use to contain the virus mind? They destroyed all of his zombies. And then everyone hears a creak and sees Simon. And Jennifer shouts, he will do. The channeled hive mind then begins to enter Simon. And once it's done, Hood says they really did him and the night shift a solid, saving their bacon. So we won't have to whack the whole lot of them. Next time, though... Not so much. Everyone looks at Simon, stating that they need a new place to contain Mr. Garth with him being the sole carrier now, and his only friend Zombie Pool is dead. Elsewhere though, out at sea, Zombie Pool is on a boat singing, Thank you, Simon, you're the best friend a head has ever had. head of Deadpool known as Headpool was set off to sea to find other adventures. This is the story of that head. But before we can talk about the head, we need to start with Deadpool himself, the proper Deadpool in this older storyline. Keep that in mind, this is an older storyline and probably not in continuity anymore. For Deadpool, it was just another day in the mercenary world as he is shot down to Earth in a small space pod. He was selected for this job because it's special. It's, you know, he gets to crash land into Earth. Only he can survive that. Through its wreckage, Deadpool pulls his burnt self out and he hears a voice telling him that he looks like hell. And as Deadpool looks up, he sees the voice of Kazar, who watches over the Savage Land. So Deadpool might want to explain what's going on. Deadpool tells him, well, it all started six hours ago at an AIM space station. A few weeks ago, Hydra sent a bioweapons team to the Savage Land in an attempt to find a new natural toxin that they could weaponize. In that group was an AIM operative who reported back to Hydra that they had made a significant find. So much so that AIM then sent in a heavily armed retrieval team. So just as soon as Deadpool meets with his contact to get the package from them, he'll be out of his hair. But as Deadpool begins to get dressed, Kazar looks at him and tells him to follow him. There's something that he would like to show him. After traveling for a little bit, Deadpool stops and says, By Odin's beard, that's a statue of me. 
Kajar says that he needs to look into this Hydra thing, so go ahead and take care of yourself. But as Kajar leaves, Deadpool begins to wonder why these cavemen possibly think that he's a god. Maybe they'll treat him like royalty if he walks down there. However, as Deadpool tries to think about what to do next, a hand reaches out and he quickly turns around, punching the person! And one of the voices in Deadpool's head says that they may have just punched a girl. And Deadpool catches her, stating that he's so sorry. He can't sneak up on a guy with mad ninja skills. After rescuing the woman, Deadpool asks her who she is anyway. She tells him that her name is Dr. Betty Swanson, his aim contact. She was supposed to have the package ready, but the headhunters have been very active lately. First, they're going to need to head to her observation blind to prepare for how they're going to get the package. So she'll leave the planning to the hotshot mercenary named Deadpool. Deadpool thinks about it for a moment and then he says that he's got the perfect plan. She'll be so impressed with his cleverness, but it's a complex plan and she'll need to listen to every detail. And one minute later, Deadpool jumps into the middle of the headhunters guns blazing, killing them, stating, that was pretty good. So long as they don't have a bunch of cavemen reinforcements, which one minute later show up and capture the two of them. They begin dragging Deadpool and Betty into their cave and the headhunters leave Deadpool into a room. And as he looks up, he shouts, that's impossible. And the head of zombie pool shouts, hiya handsome. Thanks for bringing me a fresh new body. A short while later, Deadpool and Betty are tied up and suspended over a lava pit, and Deadpool asks, what the steaming crap is going on? Zombiepool says that he was content ruling his minions as the head man, but then he was thinking how great his head would look on his body, which Grog here has volunteered to help with the delicate surgery. But he will at least do the James Bond villain thing and tell him a story before they get on with it. Originally, Zombiepool came from a parallel universe where a zombie virus had ravaged their world. So after stumbling into a mystical gate, he found himself in this world, and then due to some traveling complications, he lost his body. So him and his friend Simon became friends, and soon Simon helped stage his own death by sending him out to sea, which led him to being found by the headhunters who saw him as a god or something. Who would have thought? But anyways, it's time to make room on that body for him, so Grog will just give him a little shave just above the shoulders. Grog raises his axe and he begins to slam it down, but at the last moment, Deadpool pulls himself to the side, causing the axe to hit his arm. Zombiepool shouts out, don't let him get his but it's too late, as Deadpool begins beating everyone with his own severed arm. After throwing the arm and grabbing a hold of a gun, Deadpool frees Betty, but before he can kill any more of the cavemen, Grog crushes the gun, and Deadpool tells him, hey, I was shooting people with that. Deadpool quickly grabs one of his katanas, and with a dramatic slice, he stops and counts down from three. As soon as he says one, Grog's head pops off, and Zombiepool says, well, see, my plan worked out perfectly. Now these guys are dead, and you can take me out of here. Good job, buddy. Deadpool grabs Zombiepool and gets ready to throw him into the lava pit, but Betty stops him, telling him to wait. The head is the whole reason AIM sent him here. And Zombiepool says, see, I'm special. Just head deeper into the cave to escape. What they find is an escape route, though it's a giant waterfall. But before Betty can figure out what's going on, Deadpool grabs her and he jumps down it. Once the two of them wash up along the shore, Betty suggests that since it's getting dark, they set up camp. And in the morning, she's going to sneak into the Hydra camp to have AIM pick them up. A short while later after the campfire is set up, and Zombiepool asks him, is there some grub to eat? And Deadpool asks him, where would it go? Zombiepool says, hey, I'm a zombie. I just like to chew on things. So Deadpool gives him a bug to eat. The next morning, the three wake up and head out. And Betty says that they need to be careful. There's some trouble ahead. Deadpool sticks Zombiepool onto a stick to keep watch. And once the coast is clear, they continue onwards. But Betty says that they need to be careful. Normally, when the large predators leave, the little ones come next. Deadpool looks around and decides that he doesn't see any, and that's when a raptor jumps out of the bushes, pulling him in. Betty says, oh god, she's going to die, and Deadpool tells her, I will save you, and he stabs the raptor in the mouth and begins to ride him. The raptor flails trying to throw Deadpool off, but after the raptor falls landing on him, Betty asks if he's okay. Deadpool says he's good, and a voice tells him, what a relief! I would hate to think that we came all this way to find a corpse. The two look up at a Hydra agent, and after a quick thought, Betty says, thank god, this guy's a kidnapper. The Hydra agent says, nice try, but we're gonna deal with you later. First, we need to tase Deadpool. And after looking at him, the captain says, this is the wrong guy. They're looking for the guy's decapitated head, except zombie-ish. Kazar watches from afar, stating that he just knew the little guy was gonna cause trouble. After a few more hits from the taser, Deadpool manages to kick the commander away by hitting him with the groin, and with his high-pitched voice, he tells everyone, Get him! As the Hydra agents start to pile on Deadpool, he shouts, It's clobbering time! And a voice in his head tells him that they really need to develop their own catchphrase. Deadpool begins to fight off the group, and the commander tells everyone to forget the taser, just shoot him! Suddenly, the soldiers open fire as Betty watches, and as Deadpool's body falls to the ground, the commander looks back at Betty and tells her that he wants the bioweapon. He wants it now! But as the two of them talk, a little voice calls out to him, and the 
commander looks down to see Zabipo telling him, Hey, you should feed me! Elsewhere in the jungle, Kazar runs out of the brush with his tiger Zabu, thinking that it should attract the help that they need, and that's when a T-Rex starts charging towards them. Back with the Hydra agents, one of the soldiers states that they have an incoming emergency pointing at Kazar. The commander says the guy in the loincloth is hardly an emergency, but the soldier says not that. He's talking about the T-Rex following him. The T-Rex charges through, chomping down on the soldiers just as the headhunters begin their attack to reclaim Zombie Pool. The commander begins issuing orders to each squad, and Zombie Pool asks, Did you ever think in a million years you'd be issuing orders like, Engage the Dinosaur? As the battle between the Hydra, the T-Rex, and now the headhunters begin, Betty tells Deadpool to please get up in a slightly mean tone, followed by a lot of explicitives. Deadpool asks, Why? Did I miss something? And Betty points to the battle, stating, Yeah, you're missing everything! The headhunters begin piling onto Deadpool, and he notices the commander fighting off everything while still holding onto zombie pool. A headhunter then tackles him, causing him to throw the head, and Deadpool tries to grab it, but instead it lands on the shaman stick, and zombie pool shouts, Hooray! I'm a deity again! That is until he gets eaten by the T-Rex. Deadpool breaks free from the headhunters, and he finds one of the Hydra Gatling guns just as zombie pool's head falls back into his hands. Deadpool asks, Are you ready, Butch? And zombie pool says, Ready, Sundance! Let's ride! Deadpool begins creating a path through the crowds, and just as him and the rest get out, Kazar tells him to go ahead. He'll lead the forces away. And Deadpool tells him, Thanks, you're pretty okay for a guy with a limited wardrobe. As the three of them make their way through the jungle, Betty's watch begins to beep, and she tells them that it's just a GPS from AIM in case they ever get lost. Zombie Pool says, That's nice, but can we get some food, please? I haven't eaten anything since I took a bite out of that T-Rex. Meanwhile, back at the AIM space station, with no contact from Betty telling them what's going on, they assume the worst, and they decide that they're going to vaporize everything within a square mile of her GPS locator. Back on Earth, and now Zombie T-Rex chases after everyone, and Betty climbs up a tree telling Deadpool to hurry, they need to get higher up. Deadpool starts to climb up, but as Betty reaches for him, the T-Rex snags a hold of one of Deadpool's straps, and all he can do is grab her watch. The T-Rex tosses Deadpool into a tree, and Betty asks if they should help him, but Zombie Pool says, Nah, he's pretty durable. What say we get some flapjacks? Up in the space station, the crew begins to charge and fire their lasers while Deadpool tries to escape the charging T-Rex. But after getting out into a clearing, the watch begins to beep again and Deadpool stops asking what it could mean. Maybe it's an alarm! Maybe she needs to take a pill! What if she needs to take her birth control? And then a shadow looms over, the shadows of a foot, and it stomps down on him. The light begins to shine in the sky and Deadpool asks what that could be and the entire area explodes! Betty watches the explosion go off, but Zombie Pulse says, Don't worry, he'll be along sooner or later. She tries to respond with, Nothing can live through Oh My God. And from the fire, Deadpool says, He's parched! Anybody for a fresca? After regrouping, the three go back out and stumble upon a Hydra aircraft. Deadpool sees one of the guards step out eating a sandwich and asks if there's cheese on that, and then he punches them taking the sandwich. Once Betty gets on board, she begins to hit liftoff, and Deadpool says that he's really gonna miss the Savage Land. Maybe he should build a summer home here, a little cottage near that volcano. But as the team takes off, the Hydra commander looks up seeing Deadpool, and he says he really needs to find a way to kill that guy. He then pulls out his communicator to radio down another ship to pick them up. He also tells the captain of the Battle Forget to move into attack positions. After taking a much-needed shower, Betty radios the AIM space station to let them know that they're on their way with the package. Just make sure not to shoot them since they're on a Hydra spacecraft. Once the ship boards, the sub-commander Blake tells Deadpool excellent work. He's worth every penny that they're paying him. And Deadpool asks if he can pay him in cash. Just like the giant white bags with the green money signs on them, please? Blake tells Betty to go ahead and bring the head into the lab to contain it, and in the meantime, Deadpool can go to the room that they set aside for him to, uh, freshen up. After changing and getting a new set of clothes, one of Deadpool's voices asks how long they're going to avoid talking about this. They know what will happen if the virus gets loose on Earth. Everyone is going to die. And Deadpool says, surely not everyone. Not the iCarly kids, Adam West, Paula Abdul. But the voice responds telling him, what part of everyone don't you understand? Deadpool begins to shout, oh god, we gotta get the head back. And another voice says, now we only need a random occurrence to provide a convenient distraction. Suddenly, the Hydra frigate opens fire on the AIM space station. While the two forces begin battling, Deadpool makes his way over to the lab, breaking out Zombie Pool, and Zombie Pool asks him, oh, did you miss me already? The explosions begin to go off, and Zombie Pool asks to bring him up to speed. He explains that Hydra is attacking, and they're going to escape on a spaceship, but first they gotta get Dr. Betty. And Zombie Pool says, forget her. I think she wore a lot of flannel, if you get what I'm saying. The Deadpool tells him, in no way do I understand what you're talking about. As the space station begins to explode, everyone begins to head towards the evacuation ships, and Deadpool sees everyone else had the same idea, get to the evacuation ships. The lasers begin firing, and Deadpool grabs a hold of Betty so that the two can escape together, and once aboard the evac ship, Deadpool tells the pilot to take them to Florida. And if he sees the Taco Bell along the way, wait, Bob? 
Deadpool lifts the pilot's helmet and he tells him, no, his name is. But Deadpool stops him stating, Bob, I thought you were back on Earth with Hydra and dead and in a different book. The man says that his name is Bill, agent of AIM, and Betty shouts, can they just get the hell out of here now? The other pilot begins to take off and Deadpool says, it's just like Han Solo told Chewbacca, fly casual. The pilot then says, actually, he likes the three newer films better. Hayden Christensen is an amazing actor. Deadpool looks at him and then shoots him in the head. And he tells Bill, say Jar Jar Binks is an abomination. Say it! Just as the ship takes off, the Hydra frigate receives an incoming call from Deadpool asking if they want to discuss the terms of his surrender. Betty slaps him, stating that they should just give them whatever they want before they kill them. And Deadpool says that his colleagues suggested that they work out a deal so that they don't get torpedoed into oblivion. You guys still want the head, right? Well, I'll jettison it out the airlock and you just give me some time to escape and we all get what we want. Everyone wins! The commander says that he agrees, but if Deadpool double crosses him, so Deadpool releases the package out the airlock and Hydra secures it, allowing Deadpool's ship to leave. But just as the commander opens up the box, he sees that it's not zombie pool, it's a bomb. And after the bomb explodes, Deadpool tells Bill to just go ahead and take them to Florida. Warp Factor 5! And Bill says that this ship doesn't, but Deadpool tells him he said Warp Factor 5. Yes, sir, Bill says. A short while later, back on Earth, Bill flies the aircraft, nearly knocking over some locals in a fishing boat. The locals paddle back to the shore, and Deadpool steps out, stating, Hey, rednecks, have any of you guys seen a dimensional gateway around here? And Zombie Pool says, You know, I wouldn't mind some lunch. Could you guys spare a foot? Maybe just a toe? The locals begin running away, and Deadpool says, You know, you're really a people person, Zombie Pool. And Zombie Pool tells him, It's a gift, my man, a gift! Bill begins surveying for the portal since Zombie Pool doesn't know exactly where it's at. You know, the portal that'll get him back to his zombie world. And as they travel through the muck, something behind them begins to rise. Zombie Pool mentions that he remembers this swamp. Him and Simon had a hell of a time in the Caribbean. They made a lot of friends and observed some interesting wildlife. Just then, Man-Thing jumps out of the waters to attack, and Betty and Bill open fire while Deadpool just sits in the water. Zombie Pool says that, that thing is slow moving. If they haul ass, they can leave him in the dust. But as they turn to run, Deadpool says that it sounds like he tangled with Shaggy McGregor garden hose face before. Zombie Bill tells him, I have no idea what you're talking about, and I will ignore any further questions regarding this thing. But as they begin to escape Man-Thing, they find themselves surrounded by Hydra agents. The captain says that there's been a slight change of plans for them. They're going to take the head, and him and Mr. Wilson will draw blades. Deadpool says, I'm always up for that, but who are you exactly? Who am I? Says the man. I'm Lord Baron Von Tito Habsburg Rothschild Falcon the Seventh. Falcon pulls out his sword, telling Deadpool that he will carve him into so many pieces that his healing factor won't even be able to bring him back. But just before he attacks, the man thing grabs the two guards. Falcon looks back and says that he may be at a disadvantage now. Nevertheless, he will still be more than a match for Deadpool. Deadpool says that he accepts the challenge, holding out Zombie Pool's head. And just as Deadpool begins to pull out his sword, Falcon begins to swing. As the two swords meet, Deadpool says, turn your head and call Falcon. And he asks, what nonsense is he talking about? Oh. Falcon falls to his knees, holding his groin, stating, Not cool. But just as he goes to finish his sentence, Deadpool swings once more, lopping off Falcon's head. Once the head lands, Zombie Pool says that it's time for lunch, and Betty mentions that whenever Deadpool is around, body parts seem to become airborne, to which Deadpool tells her that he hadn't noticed. Bill tells everyone that they are close, and soon a purple light begins to shine. Deadpool asks if it's the super hyper dimensional taxi stand that he remembers, and Zombie Pool tells him, Oh yeah, come to Papa! Deadpool steps into the portal with a comment of one small step for Deadpool, one giant leap, but Zombie Pool stops and tells him, would you just get the hell on with it already? And after jumping through it, Deadpool and Headpool found that their journey wasn't as simple as just going back through the portal. When the two popped out, they find themselves in Canada, with Major Wilson of the Canadian branch of S.H.I.E.L.D. running things. So after a quick battle with his rather gorgeous self, the two jumped back in the portal and ended up in another world, also not overrun with zombies. This time though, instead of finding Deadpool, they find Lady Deadpool, who is in the middle of fighting Captain America. Deadpool decided that he didn't want to pass up on the chance to get some, and fantasizes that he had helped Lady Deadpool and the two of them are kissing. But both quickly realized that this was a terrible idea, and he jumped back in the portal. Next, they found themselves in the Wild West with the Deadpool of a kid, Kidpool. Except Deadpool stopped caring about all of this and killed him, and then went right back into the portal. To everyone's surprise, they wound up in the original universe with Betty and Bill. Betty tells him that she thought he was getting rid of that zombie head. They were gone for like 10 seconds. And Deadpool asks, how is that even possible? Do you even know what we just went through? And a voice tells them, perhaps I can answer that. After all, I am Sorcerer Supreme, Dr. Voodoo. 
Voodoo explains that because the two of them have been jumping from universe to universe, they have been creating a disturbance in the portal's cosmic awareness. So he will realign the gateway so that they now may complete their mission. But be warned, the portal will only stay open for her so long. Deadpool tells Voodoo that if he's going to be Sorcerer Supreme, he should grow out a mustache. Doctor Strange had a great mustache. Once the two of them leave, Betty notices Man-Thing standing behind them and decides, you know what? Screw the swamp. And her and Bill jump through the portal. Everyone looks around at the destroyed city. And Headpool tells everyone, yeah, zombies aren't real good at keeping the house clean. Because as it turns out, they have now returned to the original Marvel Zombies universe. As they begin to head off to their objective, something else walks through the portal. Subcommander Blake and other AIM agents begin to walk out, and he tells everyone that they don't have much time as the portal closes. After a bit of traveling, the four decide that they're going to hide out for a bit, and Betty asks what they're going to do about getting back home. And Headpool tells them, well, since the flow of time is all messed up for me and Deadpool jumping around, we might just need to find out when we arrived. That way, we can go find my past self and jump into the portal before Zombie Morbius and past Zombie Pool jump in. Then everyone hears somebody say that they have a better plan. Just then, Fabian Stankowczyk bursts through the wall in a giant mech suit, stating, First, I will snap your spines. Then, I will feed on you. Fabian rushes forward, knocking Deadpool away, but suddenly everyone hears a missile being fired, and then Fabian's suit explodes. Everyone looks back to see a group of humans and a woman telling them that they looked like they could use a hand. Or maybe they could just be handy. She introduces herself as Professor Veronica Chase, and Betty shakes her hand, telling her, good to meet them. As Deadpool and Headpool look at the two girls, two words come to mind, mud and a wrestle. Veronica leads the group back to her underground hideout and tells them that when they saw them coming, a few of them threw this place together. There's food, weapons, beer, and even a PlayStation 3. Deadpool announces that as the team of Team Deadpool, they will rest here for a day or two or a week or maybe a month or until they can arrange to accidentally see Professor Veronica naked. After a few days and a lot of hot pockets, Deadpool decides that he's going to go see how Betty and Veronica are getting along in Veronica's lab. Deadpool offers to help if they need it, or maybe he could nuke some hot pockets for them, but Veronica mentions that there is actually something he could help them with. They are currently very close to coming up with a serum to stop the virus, and with his unique set of skills, they could use him to capture a zombie. If he does, they might be able to work out some kind of a reward. Without much of a thought, Deadpool quickly agrees, but for this plan to work, he's going to need a sewing machine. A little while later, out in the waist, Deadpool walks up to a group of zombies with Headpool sewed to the top of his head. The zombies ask what's wrong with his body, and Headpool tells them that he had to put himself back together after a big Galactus battle. But never mind that, has anyone seen some, uh, humans? I'm starving here. Everyone tells him that if there were some, they would have already been eaten. So no, there's none around. Before leaving, though, he whispers to the zombie Cypher that if he's really hungry, just follow him for a few minutes. But anyway, catch everyone later! Three minutes later, Cypher asks what this is all about, and Headpool tells him, Flesh, my boy, just follow me. Once Headpool leads him away from the buildings, Veronica's crew springs the trap, capturing Cypher, and they bring him back into their base. Veronica says, thanks for getting a non-combat specimen like this. He's utterly weak and helpless. And Cypher shouts, I'm right here. But outside with the other zombies, they hear a voice asking them what's up. The past Deadpool, the one that was already here before they traveled to the portal coming to this period of time, tells them, you know, I shouldn't have to tell you this, but if you can't trust a random bunch of zombies, who can you trust? He wanted to tell them that their human flesh-eating needs are about to be solved thanks to yours truly. Two words, dimensional gateway. And that's all he could say about that. Anyways, he's got a man to see about a horse. Seriously, we're gonna go eat a horse. Back in the hideout, Deadpool freshens up with some Axe body spray, and he gets swag for his date. Once he's ready, he heads over to Veronica's room, telling himself to remember, just think about baseball. Think about George Will thinking about baseball. Much later, Deadpool stops to smell the flowers, and Bill tells him that they need to talk. Now that they've returned the head to this dimension and helped these people, it's time for them to go home. First, Deadpool tells him no way. There's flapjacks here every morning, and all the fresca he can drink, along with the hottest piece of tail on the planet. Literally, he isn't going anywhere. But a little while later, during his bubble bath, the voices inside Deadpool's head tells him, you know, Bill is right. Betty and Bill do need to go home. Finally, he agrees with the voices and tells them, stupid naggy voices, and he goes to tell Veronica goodbye. He tells her that they must go. His work here is done and he has other responsibilities. And Veronica tells him, no problem. She will have a team ready in the morning to escort him. Deadpool goes on stating, please, no tears or long goodbyes. Wait, what? And Veronica says that she said no problem. What they did was just business. Betty laughs, stating that she will go back to her things. Stud. The next morning, Veronica tells everyone good luck as she sees them off. But before they can get far, Crusher and the other zombies tell them that they knew that if they waited here, something would crawl out. Put your bibs on, it's showtime! From behind the group, Blake with the game agents tells them that they finally got the drop on him and they're here to take that head back. Deadpool looks at him pointing ahead and Blake looks up stating, oh. 
as he sees the other zombies there. The AIM agents open fire and the zombies begin chasing after them, leaving Absorbing Man with Deadpool and the rest of them. Headpool tells him to lay off, but he tells him no thanks. He'll start with the little girl right away. Veronica pulls out a rocket launcher and fires a rocket, launching Absorbing Man away. However, Absorbing Man gets up from the blast and Deadpool asks if he can borrow that. He wants to make a specific rhetorical point. As Absorbing Man makes his way back to the group, he tells Deadpool, you could've used that again? It won't even knock me off my feet now. And Deadpool tells him, shh, I'm aiming. And then he fires, missing him. Absorbing Man starts to laugh at him. <laughs> and the rocket hits the wall behind him and Deadpool begins to run as the building begins to fall on them. Through the rubble, Deadpool crawls out, thinking that he needs a really good quip ready. Maybe something about shifting the real estate market. And then he shouts, I killed the building! And the voice tells him he nailed it. As Veronica and her team leave, Bill with the AIM troops says that he felt a lot safer around those guys. And Deadpool says that they told him that they never really liked him anyway. Bill just sighs. <sighs> Once the four of them reach the hangar, Deadpool tells everyone that there's their ride, no need to thank them. But cash and foot rubs will do. Bill says that he's never flown one of these before, and Deadpool tells him it's perfectly good for transportation. Now, man your blimp! However, not long into their flight, Betty tells everyone that they may have some company. Looking back, Betty sees Iceman and Firebird flying in, and Iceman begins to cover the blimp in ice. The weight of the ice begins to send the blimp crashing into a nearby building, and Deadpool tells everyone, I will handle this, and he jumps out after Firebird. Through one of her blasts, Deadpool jumps again, telling her that her order for medium rare Deadpool coming right at ya. But for him, he'll have a shish kebab, and he stabs her with both of his swords. The two of them go crashing to the ground below, and looking down at her, Deadpool tells her that she's kinda still got his sword in her. He's gonna need that back, along with her head. Back up in the building, Betty and Bill try to fight off Iceman, but he tells them that he was an X-Man. Do you really think guns are gonna stop him? Ice starts forming around Betty and he grabs a hold of her, stating that he doesn't mind having to work a little for it. It'll make the taste all that much sweeter. Meanwhile, back at Veronica's hideout, her and the team start to rescue the others that were trapped in the hideout as the building that Deadpool shot fell on them. Back on the ground, people begin to hear another rumble, and through the debris, Absorbing Man breaks out, grabbing one person, telling them, Daddy is home! Back over the building, just before Iceman is about to bite into Betty, he hears the elevator doors ding, and then a light shines from them. Suddenly, Deadpool rides out on a motorcycle, and he jumps off of it, sending it right into Iceman. As the bike begins to fall, it pins Iceman on a beam, breaking his spine. And he shouts, I can't feel my legs! 20 minutes later, after thawing out Bill, Deadpool tells everyone that before they can go killing anyone else, they're gonna need some new clothes. Nice man asks if anyone can help him. Please? Mommy? 30 minutes after that, Deadpool and the rest of them find a clothing store with 70s and 80s clothing, which everyone suits up in except for Headpool because he's just a head. You really can't get clothes on that. Now that they have their fancy new digs, Deadpool tells everyone that it's time for a new blimp. Just let him call Veronica for help. Veronica tells him sure she can help, but she won't be there for a bit. And by the time dinner comes, she'll be ready for a bite. Because now, they're all zombies. Everyone begins to climb the stairs up, and Betty notices that Deadpool has a roll of toilet paper, and he just tells her they never know when they're gonna need to fly. But not long after that climb, Betty sees the figure of Veronica, and that's when she says, Oh crap! Deadpool sees Veronica just as he remembers, pretty wanting to kiss him. However, before that kiss can happen, Betty runs in, elbowing her to the ground. Deadpool says, Alright, just shoot her this way so I can cut her head off. And then Absorbing Man smacks Deadpool down. Bill starts shooting him in the legs, but then he forgot to change into something that could absorb the hits. So he reaches out for some rebar, sticking up from the walls. Deadpool comes up with a great idea before Absorbing Man can touch the metal, and he throws the roll of toilet paper at him, causing him to absorb that. He then jumps on him, slicing through the top of Absorbing Man's toilet paper head, stating something that even Marvel decided to remove. And the voices state that they can't believe he actually went there. Next, Deadpool backs Veronica to the edge of the building, and she tells him to wait, let her free, and they can have the serum that she perfected. Only problem is that it must be taken before a person reaches a certain stage, which she herself has already passed. She tells them okay, no shooting decapitation tossing off the building. Promise? And Deadpool says he promises. But looking back at Betty, he says, well, she doesn't promise. Deadpool holds onto the serum as Veronica falls off the building, and Betty tells everyone that that was a surprisingly satisfying experience. Once that is taken care of, everyone heads to the roof and tells everyone to look, the helicopter is invisible. Actually, that's a joke, we have no helicopter. Above them, they begin to hear the thwip of a helicopter, and they see Blake and Ashcroft already flying in. Blake tells them that they need each other. They need a ride, and he needs the head. It's a habit of bargain. 
Due to the helicopter having a limited fuel tank, the group has decided to make stops along the way, and during one of those stops, Betty and Bill raid the vending machines for everyone so that they can eat. When they return, Betty says that before he can ask, no, there was no Fresca Deadpool. And while everyone eats, Blake notices Headpool's been left alone. Blake calls for Bill to come over and knocks him out, and then he tells Deadpool that there's a horde of zombies coming, they have to go get them. Deadpool tells him to get the chopper ready, but as he and Betty run in to stop these zombies, they realize that there aren't any zombies. And then Blake and the helicopter starts laughing at them. Blake tells Headpool that he better not cause him any problems, and as he points his finger at Headpool, he bites down, taking off the finger. Headpool tells him that the virus is going through his bloodstream, so if he wants to live, he's going to have to deal with him. So without delay, Blake turns around and begins to brag Deadpool to give him the serum. Deadpool tells him, fine, but you have to promise to be my slave forever and bring me breakfast in bed every morning. Blake tells him, of course, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and he begins drinking the serum. But after he burps, he says, that's not very tasty. The flavor is disturbingly familiar. And everyone loads back up in the helicopter and Deadpool shouts, full speed ahead, Mr. Bill. As they take off, Blake begins to feel a little strange. Deadpool looks at his watch stating, and right at the 18 minute mark. Betty asks what he's talking about and he tells her he just needed to see how long it took for the virus to take effect. And Blake then asks him, what did I drink? Deadpool tells him, well, I had about 20 cans of Mountain Dew at the last stop and my bladder was about to pop. He then kicks Blake out of the helicopter. Ashcroft begins to cry through his helmet stating, I quit. And Deadpool tells him, buck up, buddy. He never treated you right anyway. One tank of fuel later, Bill tells everyone that the tank is bone dry and they're about to crash. Right about now. The helicopter comes crashing down into the swamp, and once they get out, Bill mentions that this place seems very familiar. And Betty shouts that this is the same place that he crash landed in the other dimension. Deadpool tells everyone to put a sock in, and it is time for them to march through the swamp. Again, after a bit of sloshing through the swamp, the group takes a break and Headpool begins to talk to himself. He looks up and sees Bill staring at him and he tries to tell him, Yeah, I know I said that out loud, so what? Elsewhere though, Deadpool begins to take his shirt off when he hands his katana to Betty, telling her that she needs to hack his arm off for his plan to work. At first, she tells him what the hell does it, oh forget it, and she begins to hack away. He tells her that he needs another favor now cut a huge hole in his shoulder. She swings, and after a bit of running around screaming, he tells her, for the last thing, bring him that severed head. Through the bushes, Man-Thing begins to rise, and Deadpool shouts to them not to worry about it this time. It's time for some hot double Deadpool action. Deadpool asks why exactly has he sewn him on backwards, but now as Deadpool begins to face off with the now past Zombie Pool, Zombie Pool sees Man-Thing and says, oh, now I get it, guarding the rear, so to speak. However, before any real fighting can be done, a bolt of lightning strikes and everyone looks up to see zombie Dr. Voodoo. Voodoo tells everyone that it is he who will be going through the portal this time. He will be locking it behind himself, so he will have the dimension all to himself. Everyone shoots at him and the fighting between everyone starts again. While Betty manages to tear apart Zombie Man-Thing with her gun, past Zombie Pool hacks away at Deadpool getting Headpool's head back off of him. He tells him that it seems that he would have had a much better chance in a fight where he's surrounded, but in a one-on-one, -on -one, this whole plan of a sewing on the head to his shoulder didn't work so much. He then tells everyone congrats on the fully functioning limbs, but he has something that he won't ever have again, and that's friends. As Betty and Bill point their guns at his head, he says, well, they do look delicious, and the two fire until there's nothing left past Headpool's head. Voodoo incinerates everyone else and then turns his focus to Deadpool, telling him that he will be the first to feed on his blonde friend there. But suddenly a gator jumps out of the water, pulling him down, and Bill says, this place is lousy with gators. Deadpool then takes the serum to stop the zombie virus from spreading since Headpool was stitched onto him. And Deadpool shouts, are you guys forgetting something? And Deadpool tells him, a deal's a deal, and he puts Headpool's head on his past self's headless body. Zombie Pool jumps back up, stating, I can feel it! My healing factor is kicking in, and now I'm hungry! Back to the buffet! And he jumps through the portal. Deadpool then says he freely admits he did not see that coming. As he jumps through himself, he sees himself running into the same airboat blade as before, and being just ahead, and then drifting out to sea, reliving the exact same events that put him into the position in the first place. As the head drifts away, he says, you know, I did have that coming, didn't I? Back at the portal, Bill jumps through stating anything is better than this place, and Betty says that it looks like they've come a long way. So she will express her gratitude with a kiss. Deadpool asks if this means that they're going to be getting married, and Betty says he can buy her dinner instead, and the two of them jump through the portal. Except Deadpool doesn't go back to his dimension. Instead, he stands before a man telling him that he is the elder of the universe known as the Contemplator, and he has plucked Deadpool out of the cosmic flow for a purpose. Deadpool tries to say, but him and Betty, they were about, we were about to, but the Contemplator tells him, Fear not, she has been returned to her home dimension. There's no need to worry about your love life. There is a mighty threat that will affect the multiverse, and you, Wade Wilson, can battle this threat. Deadpool looks at him and tells him, the hell you say?
on Earth Z. Zombie Peter Parker tries to tell Cortez not to do it, but before he can finish his sentence, he sees that it was too late. He looks around to see a new vibrant world, unpolluted by his kind, and he decides that it's time to try and find the others. He leaps off the building, and with the loss of his cosmic powers from changing dimensions, he uses his veins to swing through the city. With no one in sight, Peter reads the newspaper and sees that not only did he get sent to a different dimension, he was also sent back in time. Around the time that this world's Peter Parker was in college. But also that this is the time when mob leaders were also trying to decipher a tablet that reveals the key to eternal youth. That's it! He shouts, ripping the paper. If he can get that tablet first, he can rid himself of this curse. He will no longer be a zombie. Over at Empire State University, Zombie Peter is looking down at his younger self and Mary Jane. But this time, instead of eating her, he decides that he must save her. Suddenly, an explosion goes off, and the Sinister Six begin their attack to take the tablet. Zombie Peter begins to smell Craven's scent, but he decides that he must control himself. But those jungle herbs, they make him want to feed! Peter jumps on Craven and he begins biting and ripping out his throat, and everyone just stops. And one by one, Peter begins killing the remaining members. First, he punches Mysterio through his dome, pulling out his brain, and then uses Electro to electrocute Doc Ock. Vulture tries to get away, but Peter jumps up, ripping his arms off, and then he uses them to cut Electro's head off. Last standing is Flint Marco, and he shouts, What are you doing? You're breaking all of the rules! And he runs away. Inside of the university, Kingpin grabs the tablet, but seeing Peter taking out the Sinister Six, he decides that it will be him who finally stops Spider-Man. Kingpin jumps into attack, and Peter lunges at him, and chop, chop, chop. Kingpin didn't stand a chance. Elsewhere in the alley, Flint continues to run away when this world's Peter Parker swings in telling him, Not so fast, Beach Boy! Flint looks at him and begins beating him down by punching his face into the ground. He then tells him, You wanna eat people, huh? Then eat this! And then Flint begins to fill Peter with sand, so much so that his stomach becomes bloated and fat, and then pop, he explodes. Back at the university, Zombie Peter continues to feed on Kingpin, and he thinks maybe he should just feed on the bad people. That way, innocent, but then he turns and sees everyone that he bit killing all of his friends. Peter gets up killing all of the villains again, shouting that he was going to save them! What a joke he is! He's no superhero! Not with this face! He then starts to rip the skin off of his own head, exposing nothing but muscle, stating, Wherever I go, there won't be a hero. I'll be a monster! Up on the blue side of the moon, the Watcher decides that it is time that they must transgress their sacred oath by not interfering with the worlds. But as he goes to contact the other Watchers, a shadow looms over him, and giant man Hank Pym, who is a zombie, bites down stating, I'm lucky that we were teleported away. Now I can eat the entire multiverse! Two years go by, and Hank Pym finally figured out how to teleport himself back to Earth. In this world, Tony Stark became a drunk who started to lose control of his company. On his desk, though, a device alerts of a cross-world breach down in the basement. But because of its condition, it shorts out and catches fire. Tony mentions that that device is something Reed Richards found in the Watcher's lab, but had no clue what it was. Happy decided to check it out and heads down into the basement, but as he walks in, he notices some stalactites. Just then, Hank bites down on him, telling him, I know the device is here, now you'll lead me to it. Happy begins walking back into the lobby and begins biting everyone until Rhodey blows away his head. But while the zombie infection spreads, Tony and Pepper sit in Tony's office trying to figure out if this is what the device warned them about. Still unable to make out what it is, Tony tossed it in with the rest of the scrap metal and decided that it was time to have one last drink over in the men's bathroom. Rhodey finds the Iron Man suit and begins blasting his way to Tony's office. As he walks in, he sees Pepper being attacked and Tony just drinking. Rhodey goes to fire another blast, but since Tony forgot to charge the suit, he just smashes in the zombie's head. Rhodey asks if Pepper's okay, and as she turns, they see the infection is already turning her, and Tony throws up in her face. She runs away screaming, and Rhodey asks, what was that? And Tony tells him, actually, this vodka is supposed to be a cure for cancer. It has millions of nanometer-sized machines suspended in sterile alcohol. Though it never worked in trials, it seems to be tearing the disease apart. Only problem is, the zombies have to ingest it. Rhodey then plugs the suit into the charger, and Tony tells him that it will take hours. Hours that they don't have, so he's gonna have to get into the factory wing so they can get the speed charger. Zombies begin to shuffle into the office while Hank sneaks in to grab the Watcher's device. Tony says that as of now, Rhodey will be Iron Man, and he finishes his drink while the zombies begin to eat him, telling them to go on. He's full of nanobots. Rhodey blasts his way to the factory wing, and he grabs the speed charger, telling everyone Iron Man is here, and he's on his way to help. 
Two more years pass, and in Tokyo, Kitty Pride begins to meet up with Logan as hand ninjas begin to attack. She runs down the alley and she sees Logan, except that it's not this world's Logan. Zombie Logan lunges forward, but Kitty phases, and Logan rushes through her into the hand ninjas and begins tearing them apart. Once he's done eating, he turns back to Kitty and then is shot in the face with webbing. Zombie Peter Parker grabs a hold of Logan and slams him into a wall, telling Kitty that this is about to sound corny, but come with me if you want to live. Peter leads Kitty to his lab, explaining that what she saw was a zombie. He goes on to tell her about how he came from a different dimension where the zombie virus surfaced and it spread across the world, killing everyone. Zombie Logan was teleported here and has since been feeding on people unchecked, but with his research, he has created a vaccine. It won't change him back, but it will save him, dampening his appetite. The virus overwhelmed Zombie Logan's healing factor to create the vaccine. He will need this world's Logan's blood. Back outside, Zombie Logan finds himself fighting with Sunfire as he's thrown into the underground fighting rings. Iron Fist looks at him and asks what's wrong, and Zombie Logan pops his claws both through him and Sunfire's head, telling him, I'm just fine. And then a voice calls out to him, and he turns back to see this world's Logan walking up to him. Over in Peter's lab, he continues to explain to Kitty about the vaccine, but the flies are starting to bother her. He is still a zombie. She looks around to see where the flies are coming from, and phases through to see what it is, and finds body parts hanging from the ceiling. She pushes herself back out, and Peter tells her that he wanted to spare her. He then takes off his mask, telling her, It's time for the truth. Kitty shouts that he's one of them, and Peter says, Yeah, well, it's a bit complicated, but I've been working on our treatment, and I haven't killed anyone in a long time. I was so close to saving Logan, saving the world, and saving my own soul. Kitty is still hesitant about helping, but Peter hands her a wooden stake, telling her that she can just phase this into his head and it'll kill him, since he can't eat her anyway because of her abilities. But time is short. They need to get a sample of this world's Logan's blood now. Back in the fight club, both Logans are going back and forth, slashing and cutting away at each other until Kitty and Peter show up. Logan quickly turns to kill Peter, but before he can, Zombie Logan stabs Logan through the back. Kitty jumps into action, holding the stake in her hand and stabbing it down into Zombie Logan's head. But she only managed to stab his eye. He smacks her away, stating that he's pretty sure he has something in his eye. And then Logan gets back up and rips Zombie Logan's insides out. Logan turns back to Peter, telling him that he has one second to explain what's going on. Ten minutes later, Logan says, This is pretty nuts, even by my standards. As Peter leaves with the sample and Zombie Logan, Kitty and Logan watch as Kitty asks what should they do now. And Logan says, Maybe grab some grub? I kind of worked up an appetite. After witnessing the destruction of his newfound home as well as the woman that he loved, Bruce Banner, the Hulk, has returned from space to destroy the worlds of those who first exiled him. He jumps down into the blue area of the moon above Earth to begin carrying out his revenge. And as he bursts into the palace of the royal family, he calls out to Black Bolt to come and face him. But what he sees is that the palace is scattered with parts of bodies. From the shadows, Medusa tells him that he does not want this fight. And as he gets closer, he sees Black Bolt and Medusa as zombies. Hank appears behind him, telling him, thanks for stopping by. We were starred for some company. Hank punches down on the Hulk, and in the distance, the survivors of the Hulk's planet appear shouting that they will protect their king. But one blast from Black Bolt's sonic powers blows everyone away, allowing the zombies to feed on them. Hulk jumps up as Hank begins eating and punches him across the face. Hulk then picks up Elio and begins to run outside, and just as they are clear, Elio notices something on Hulk's arm. They both look at the bite marks, and the Hulk begins to call out to the hunger. And he rips Elio in two! And he begins to devour her, and when he's finished, he looks towards Earth. After taking his ship down, the Hulk begins eating through the people of Manhattan. While Earth's armies try to fight him off, Sentry flies in telling Bruce to forgive him. And he blasts him through a building, punching and beating him down, telling the Hulk that this greatly pains him. But the Hulk then changes back to Bruce, telling him, Wait! You just don't understand! This hunger! Sentry changes back and he tells him, Whatever this is, we're gonna find a way to fix it. And just then, Bruce leaps up, biting Sentry in the arm, and then he changes into his uniform, stating, I understand now. Meanwhile, Zombie Peter watches, stating that this just keeps getting worse and worse. He's going to need backup, and right now, it's time for the Avengers to dismember! Over in the Avengers Tower, several of the now-turned zombies sit around discussing their number one kill. With the world destroyed and mostly eaten, the zombies have to pass time sitting around talking about their glory days, when the zombies' armies all fought each other. But while Hank continues to work, trying to figure out the Watcher's device to unlock the rest of the multiverse, the hunger alert goes off. Quicksilver runs over to Professor X's body, which is still hooked up to Cerebro, and sees that there is some fresh human meat that they missed over in the Savage Land. 
Everyone loads up in the Quinjet and they fly out, but as they begin to get closer to where the signal came from, the Quinjet is shot down. The zombies begin to pick themselves up as Peter tells them, Lucky they were already dead, huh? Well, the new Avengers are here to make sure that they are erased and will never be allowed to infect another dimension again. Sentry asks them what about the flesh that they detected, where is it? Rhodey begins burning through the zombies, telling them that he's got their flesh right here. You never managed to turn me. Every time that he got bitten, he just cut off that part of his body and replaced it with some Stark tech. So what's one less finger? He's got two more. The fight between the two zombie factions erupts with everyone rushing in to kill each other. Moon Knight tells Thundra to get Spider-Man. He has something attached to his back. She says that she does not take orders from men. Fortunately, she was going to do that anyway. But before she can, the Hulk rips her body in half, telling her, Bugman is Hulk's friend. He teaches Hulk all zombies must die. Quicksilver runs past, snatching the canister off of Peter, but as he runs away, Peter launches out his vein webbing, ripping off Quicksilver's head. Quicksilver's body continues to run, and Peter shouts for someone to stop that body. Logan then charges in towards Sentry, telling him that he'll never forgive him for killing Kitty. Sentry knocks him away, telling him that he is both an unstoppable force and a movable object. Logan tells him, unstoppable I can work with, just as long as I can cut something. He stabs into Sentry, but he knocks him away asking, do you know what you've just done? Do you want to release the power of a million exploding suns? As the Sentry tries to contain himself, a blue light beams down on everyone, and Sentry sees that he's now been teleported back up to the moon in a test tube. Hank tells him that he figured out how to unlock the rest of the multiverse. He just needed a power source. Say, a power source of a million exploding suns? Now with everyone on the moon, the battle continues with everyone trying to get the canister back, and Logan manages to cut it open. Everyone looks and sees the canister was filled with sand, and Moon Knight asks, are they supposed to be impressed by this? Peter says that Tony Stark developed nanites that attack the disease. The only problem is that they needed to be eaten. So he tracked down an old friend who can force everyone to ingest him and loaded him up with the vaccine. Flint Marco begins to swirl around, forcing the sand into everyone, and soon everyone's bodies begin to decay and fall apart. Peter tells Flint Marco, thank you, but he just tells him, good riddance. As Hank's body begins to fade away, a light begins to shine and the Watcher appears, stating that that was fascinating. Flint Marco says they told him that he was dead, and the Watcher says that he is a being of pure energy. There's nothing to be turned, even as persistent as the zombies were. All he was doing was observing the events unseen, waiting for the then-perfect solution to present itself. Using the power of the Sentry, the Watcher goes on stating that this terror shall never begin, because it never truly began. With a flash in the sky, the human Avengers appear. And there you have it. The storyline for Marvel Zombies, as much as we've done on the channel at least, they're even going to bring the series back and try this again. And as you watch all of those, you can see that it kind of went in weird directions. Like, how did Ghost Rider even become a zombie? It doesn't make any sense. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time, right here at Comic Story.